Thanks so much. This is actually a perfect segue from the last paper because I'm definitely someone who works in um, the public face of archaeology. I, I create those glossy little exhibitions that try to attract the public to come to them. Um, and so that's a really interesting journey. And a bit about what the paper I'm going to give today is about is a bit about public perception of climate change. So the main premise of what I want to do in the next few minutes is basically deal with something that I have a problem with, and that is the x-axis of every single climate change discussion that exists. For me, the current structure and perception of time individually by decision makers and societally by decision makers is fundamentally wrong. Like, I think that every single climate change solution starts with the words, by 2050, we will be net zero, or within 35 years, we will reduce. And the use of planetary years as a framework for the human experience, I think is a falsehood. And I think that archeologists are the best people to deal with aspects of time. And I feel like we need to change the perception of time. And so the end of time, for me, is an end of planetary time to one which can be differently conceived. So I will take you on a little bit of a journey through time. Um, and what I'm trying to do is deconstruct that x-axis. I don't want planetary years to be the understanding by which people think of time. So I am the director of the coolest museum in the world that not enough people go to. It is called the Sainsbury Centre for Visual Arts. Has it, have, put your hand up if you've ever been to Sainsbury Centre for Visual Arts in UEA. Fantastic, you are my allies. Um, everyone else, you have to have been there within a year. So just to get you a sense of it, it was created in the 1970s as a genre-defying and rule-breaking museum. It was one of the first big bits of aluminium in the created by Norman Foster. So this is the outside of the building, that sort of gleaming. Now it's all the rage is to get a big bit of aluminium, put it in a city and get everyone to come there. This was one of the very first that opened in 1978. Um, and it is an absolutely beautiful building. But the construct behind it and the reason that they used the Norman Foster was because they were trying to get the concepts of art and materiality to be differently conceived. It was one of the first museums in the world that ever created an equal platform for all forms of art and material culture, be they classified as archaeological, historical, or contemporary. So when you go there, you will meet a living area where all these things are in interaction with each other. And at the time, in the 1970s, this place was world famous for breaking the rules. Art was coming off the walls. People were having a new choreography of movement with art. There was very little interpretation. And the idea you went on a self-led journey around the world, not chained by culture, history, or time, or space. So there is a reason that we can break rules at the Sainsbury Center. And going forward, that's absolutely the only reason I've gone there. So I used to be the head of the Americas for 10 years at the British Museum. Lovely job, very cushy, didn't need to leave. But the reason I left was because I was like, if there's one place in the world you could do something properly radical, it's the same center because it has roots in radicalism. So it means that the only reason I'm saying that for here is that it means that after next summer, we're going to have a very radically different program of what won't even be called exhibitions, it'll just be a program at the same center. So we're not going to be having exhibitions like on the Iron Age or on Picasso or Art Nouveau. We're going to be taking very big questions that all society wants answered, and then we're going to explore it through a, dial a cultural dialogue, through time and space, through art and material culture. So luckily, I've got amazing people to do that. So Ken has only started about a month ago to start on this journey, and he's the first full-time climate change curator in the country. And his job is to simply focus on translating some of these narratives and working on big ideas and how we get them across in interesting ways. So, time. Like, I, yeah, we're archaeologists, right? We love time. Like, we've all spent time thinking about it. Like, no one else's brains get good at moving between different scales as an archaeological brain. We move between the minute and the macro, between time scales all the time we do it. And as students, we learn to do that, and it's an absolutely essential skill. And it's essential because humans, for me, have a different understandings of time. And... To me, years is a terrible way of thinking about it. 
So if you look at this, you know, Salvador Dali's classic um, Persistence of Memory from 1931, it's basically a play on the idea of how humans place their memory within the landscape and trying to get people to fluidly feel the, con the artificial construct of the clock, the time clock, as a bent realm. And it's classic surrealism, it's classic period of moving between realms, but it's an important one, right? Because that perception of time is fluid and it is flexible. So I have worked a lot and lived a lot in different parts of the world with communities and collaborators who have totally different perceptions of time. Um, and this is absolutely fascinating because it's not like, you know, oh, that's interesting. You have a different perception of time. Once you really meet people or work with cultures, both living and in the past, who have a different construct of time and perception of it, it just totally starts to blow your mind, right? Because you realize that everything you think, all the assumptions you make in life about the relationships between cause and effect, between decisions you make, they all get turned on their head. So I've done a lot of work in the Maya region, working with a student actually from UCL who was working on this project, um, Google Maya, um, and helped out. And uh, this was basically a big project at the British Museum, looking at narratives from the Maya past and present and how they communicate out into the world. And as some of you will, I'm sure, know, the Maya, particularly the ancient Maya, had incredibly interesting and conceptually contrasting senses of time. So the Maya, you know, were amazing astronomers. So they were tracking the path of Venus long before Galileo and Copernicus ever even thought of the idea. And they had incredibly good planetary observations. And therefore it wasn't like a lack of knowledge that perceived their perceptions of time. It was a co social construct that created a way of time for the Maya that chimed with their greater ways of life. So essentially Maya time is in its very simplified form, three interlocking concentric circles that move around in different ways, right? And these rotations move at different velocities and speeds. And this is very important because one of the main problems with years and planetary years is the rigidity of that imaginary timeline divided up into year segments, total rigidity, and also total uniformity along that planetary line. The Maya understand the acceleration and movement and different um, speeds and velocities of time dependent on, in their world, often ecological links with life forces in the world. So lots of their calendrical symbols were linked with living entities such as maize or rabbits or deer. And that wasn't by coincidence. It was because they were living as part of a symbiotic ecology in which the pace of life could be seen to be interacted with at different scales. And so for a concept of time, it totally changes because A, it's cyclical, so it comes round, so the present comes round again, and you comes round. And in terms of living with an environment and an ecology, you suddenly see that the scales of change of an environment are not always parallel with human time. They change at different speeds and velocities. And also you can see fundamental reshifts and reclunks of when things happen. And for the Maya, time had to be kept moving. It was the human responsibility to keep all these things clinking and clunking along in an even way. So now if the Maya were like, you know, we're sort of looking at the problem of climate change, they would be like, the cogs are not clicking. This isn't a bit of like, oh, you know, well in 30 clicks time, we'll have sorted the problem out. It's like, they're not clicking, they're not working. We need a major intervention right now. We can't look to the future. So time is fundamental. And that one there I want you to think about is velocity and acceleration and symbiotic movement between different ecologies. Because right now our temporal perception is too rigid, right? It doesn't work on your little time scales of sort of living entities and non-human entities. They're all operating on different time scales. And currently that one rigid link isn't good enough to, to tie them together. So, and that of course is like both present and past. So this program looked at sort of like different things and this goes through, maybe I haven't got enough time, but it goes through to like a radio program put on by an indigenous Maya radio station talking about time and about Maya perspectives and about how sort of life exists within the Maya world today and about the constructs of a global age and how that sort of changes. And it's good, but, uh, but it's good. But it's just good and it's sort of basically saying like, we're Maya we're not dead, we're still alive, and we still speak Maya, and we're still here, um, which is good. So that temporal perspective is not something which is locked in the past. It continues through to today. So maybe I'll take you geographically just to another sort of stop on our journey. And this is just to show you that, 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 that there's no one way of thinking about time. 
So this is an exhibition, a glossy exhibition I did on time at the British Museum called Peru, A Journey Through Time, that was really focused on Andean perspectives of time. So Andean perspective of time, again, totally blow your mind once you start going into them. Um, but essentially, you're dealing with three parallel lines where the past, the present, and the future are all happening at the same moment, right? So they, they're all existing. So your ancestors and your descendants are still alive and living. They're just in a slightly separate realm. And the only things that cut you across those lines are objects and materiality, because objects can go through time from the past, the present, and the future. Landscape, because when you're in a physical place, it cuts between past, present, and future. And also human, some people, some people with the ability can transcend between time frames. So just for a second, think if time was parallel, how you would make decisions entirely differently, right? Because your descendants are actually in the room looking at you through the lens when you're making your decisions. It's not like us who thinks, oh, you know, I feel a bit guilty about things for future generations because they're going to inherit this planet. And also it detaches you from the responsibility that we have where we put most of the blame for climate change on our ancestors, which is in the past and like the industrial revolution. So it alleviates us of blame. But like if you actually cut through the two at the same time and realize that direct responsibility between past and present and future, it totally changes your conceptualization of the issues at hand. And this is just an everyday sort of world. So if you're hanging out in the Aymara territories of Bolivia, they will always talk about the past being in front of them, which I love, right? So we always talk about the past being behind, we're in the present, the future stretches that ahead. But for them, the past is ahead, right? Because the logic is that when you're walking through a landscape, you can see some bits of the past in that landscape from people who have lived there before. And therefore, some of the past, you can see it, right? So it's in front of you. What you can't see is the future because it's not there for that, that verse behind you. So it totally flips your mentality of past to future. And then when it starts to get onto issues of cause and effect, like what causes, what decisions you make now and how it affects future generations, then it really starts to discombobulate. And that's very important as well, because at the moment, our construct of time in our current decision making allows us to alleviate ourselves of responsibility and it distances ourselves from the inheritors of problems, which is problematic. So this is very important for conceptualizations. So this, I haven't got time to talk about it now, but if you want, you can ask me in the bar later. But this was a paper I gave in Trujillo in Peru that made a comparison between efforts to solve climate change between the moche and today and between human sacrifice and recycling and, and like the logic by which both people do these actions and both they're just a social construct that doesn't actually work but it makes us feel better so that's like it gives you a sense of like time right so you think about time there are totally different ways of conceiving about time Half a lifetime ago, literally half my lifetime ago, when I was doing my PhD, it was the only time I had where I could do proper sort of reading and proper like full thoughtful immersion into this world. And I loved time and I went on a journey into time. And this is a long time ago now. But during that journey, I read huge amounts of literature, quite philosophical. I spent a lot of time in places in the world where time is perceived differently. And I created my own perception of time. And it wasn't like a thought, it was like something that totally affected my life and has now changed exactly my behaviors that have gone through time since then. And I'm gonna give you a snapshot of it now, but it is hard to explain, but I'll do my absolute best. Um, and then I've created these sort of visual reference points, but in reality, there is no visual, so you're just gonna to have to go on a mental journey. So I was in this sort of like mental space where time does not exist, right? How on earth, it was like Descartes, it was like body, mind, it was like, how do we know that time exists at all? Free form, you're in a void, black void, space. For me, time exists from my experience of it through being born and then dying, right? That is, that is birth and death are essentially my journey of my life and experience. But that is absolutely not a linear path and it is not a regular path. For me, the, the human experience that I can have is elastic. I can create more experience time by gaining experience and interacting with other human beings with knowledge and with intensity of interaction. So humans, for me, if they stay within a void without any interaction with other human beings, they are not experiencing an intensity of time. 
So I'm using this with this Tishing Se, who is just a really cool conceptual artist uh, who loved time back in the 70s. And so his perception of this was to try to lock himself. He built a prison for himself and spent one whole year within that space just having the minimum food of water as a proof of concept that, that his time would be sort of condensed or, ex or lacking of external stimuli, his time would become void. And any of you, this isn't just an abstract thought, if any of you actually go somewhere, like I spend a lot of time in caves with my current research project in the Caribbean, and when you go into a cave and have zero external stimuli, you just turn off the lights, you're there, there's no wind, there's no sound, there's nothing, and you just sit there and just do nothing, like you lose any sense of time instantly. And when you eventually switch lights and walk out, it is impossible to know how long you've been in there. And this is like an interesting experiment, but it's true that the human brain extends the experience of time based on your experiences and external stimuli. And for me, this goes up to a sort of species level or a societal or cultural level. So as an individual, time is stretchy and is a product of the intensity of human interaction, which is a product of your interaction with other human beings and with knowledge. And therefore, there's a linearity of time provided because you're all going like birth and death is all happening broadly. And that linearity is then provided by the other life living things that you come into contact with. And then the more people that you come into interaction with over time, for me, increases human time. So I believe that human time can be increased, and I believe that it's a product of the exchange of knowledge and experience, and as a byproduct of that, of technology that allows you to pass time and experience between generations. So, if you're imagining like all of human species, all of the amazing cultures that we study, and we're trying to create a form of human time that is better for thinking about climate change, this is like how I think about time. I feel like time is a product of these interactions, but then you get these step changes throughout our species development when the ability for the transfer of experience and interaction with other human beings through time gets accelerated. So these can be like writing systems that allow you to suddenly start interacting across time. Urbanism and industrialization and productions of knowledge that allow you to have these step changes in the quantities of information that you can start to gain. Like these education systems that intensify your absorption of knowledge and experience throughout time. And also your ability to travel and meet and have these greater densities of people. So throughout our species development, there has been slow then step change progression in the intensity of human time both qualitatively and quantitatively experienced on the planet. And it is absolutely a million miles away from having this regular planetary based idea of ages against which. So when I was doing my work and like that, I would look at time, I totally changed how I looked at time in terms of societal developments. I never used sort of years as time frames, but looked at this sort of broader picture, which is a product of demography and technology. So if you went with me on this journey, right? you realize that far from being a regularly spaced and sort of disparate interaction of time in years, time is a product of technology and interaction and demography. And if you take any demographic models of the planet, like it isn't like it's in any way some sort of gradual ticking along. The amount of human time that we are currently experiencing on the planet as a product of the billions and billions of people who are currently alive, in addition to the ability of technology to create those intensities of interaction between us and the facilities of knowledge, which can allow us to have those intensities of knowledge exchange, is creating a sort of explosion of human time. And if you were trying to communicate that with the sort of decision makers and policy makers today, you realize that this explosion of human time is happening right now in our current generation. And for me, that's what archaeologists can sort of get across, right? We get across that, like, this isn't a problem. You think, I've chatted policymakers quite a lot. And you meet them, and they're sort of like, oh, you know, it's only been 200 years since the Industrial Revolution. You have to give us at least another 100 to turn it around. And I'm like, you know, we just don't have that sort of time. We literally don't have that time. Because the quantities of human interaction that are happening now and the, and, and the sort of sheer power of their usage of the planet is just exploding. And that needs to get a come across in a much more powerful way. And so I am working on ways in order to try and 
get that concept across in an exhibition or in a way through the museum. But it is really hard. It's really hard to take people on a journey. And when I did the Andean sort of journey, Peru journey through time, like the actual theory and sort of like real meat to the show was pretty light, despite my best efforts, because it's so hard. You've got to take people on the journey of the show. But you're not in an exhibition. You are a tag and therefore you get to hear dense thought and you can't escape. So that is why you have gone through it. But essentially what I'm saying is this alternative framework for human time has got to be the way we look at problems of the future. Because as soon as this x-axis starts to have years in the progressions of how you think, like we've already lost the battle because there's just no way we can get to people to actually think in the sort of present and in the sort of sense of the present. And therefore, that is going to be my mission for the next three years while Ken is working on this project before a big show in about three years' time. And that's sad because it's already running out of time and I haven't even started. But uh, thanks very much. I don't know it's around time, but hopefully that wasn't too long. Thanks very much.